I'm really excited to introduce our speaker for today. Um, his name is Antonio Neves, who is a nationally recognized leadership speaker, author, and workplace consultant to top organizations and startups. I actually first heard of Antonio from our global head of diversity staffing, Daisy. And she actually handed me his book, which some of you got today, 50 Ways to Excel in Your First Job and in Life. I can honestly say I read it front to back and agreed with Daisy that it was crucial to get Antonio in here today to speak to you all and share his nuggets of wisdom. Um, just to tell you a little bit more about Antonio, he has delivered hundreds of keynotes at corporations, conferences, trade shows, and universities, including Starwood Hotels and Resorts, Stanford University, for all the Stanford folks here, the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, the Consumer Electronics Show, and many more. An award-winning journalist for over 10 years, Antonio worked in the television industry in New York City as a reporter and corresponded with top television networks, including NBC, PBS, and BET networks. A Google search will also tell you that Antonio began his television career co-hosting shows on children's television network Nickelodeon. Antonio's business writing can be read on Inc.com and Entrepreneur.com. And he's the author of three books, including 50 Ways to Excel in Your First Job and in Life. A graduate of Western Michigan University and earned a Master's of Science degree from Columbia University. Please provide a warm welcome to Antonio Neves. So I have the opportunity, I have the pleasure of traveling anywhere between 15 to 20,000 miles a month, speaking at trade associations, at corporations, at universities, you name it. And I got really excited when I saw that Google and Mountain View is on the calendar because, as I mentioned earlier, Napa Valley, uh, Napa Valley is not too far from here. So I remember looking at my wife at home and I was talking, I was like, you know, honey, I've been working really, really hard. I've been traveling a lot. And I think what I'm going to do after I finish up at Google is go to wine country for a few days by myself. I'm going to go taste some wine and walk through the, the vineyards and relax and get a little bit of R&R &R for Antonio. And my wife, she, she looked at me and, and, and she smiled and gave me this weird look and she said, oh, is that so? And then she reminded me that just a couple of months ago she gave birth to our twins, our boy Harper and our, excuse me, our, our daughter Harper and our son August. So needless to say, after I finish today, I'll be going directly to the airport. I won't be going to taste any wine whatsoever. Again, it's an honor to join you here to talk about my book, 50 Ways to Excel uh, in Your First Job and in Life. Um, this is critical to me because my passion really is supporting young professionals and doing exceptional things in their career, making them aware of the choices that they have in life. And the reason why I wrote this book is because, frankly, what I share in this book are things that have made a big difference in my life. And I would not be here talking to you today without some of those key lessons I share in that book. You see, as I travel across the country, though, those 15, those 20,000 miles a month, what I see are a lot of young professionals and college students who, on paper, on paper, everything looks right. But as we all know, on paper only tells part of the story. Maybe you go to the right university. Maybe you have the right grade point average. Maybe you're part of the right organizations. Maybe you've had the right internships. But what I've seen firsthand are so many young professionals who are kind of like a high-powered jet. They're barreling down the runway at full speed. But for some reason, they can't take off. They're struggling to take off in their career. And the research actually backs this up. We can look at some research from Gallup way back in 2015, last year, that said employers are finding that many college graduates are not prepared with the skills that they need to succeed in the workforce. Now, the skills they're talking about are something called soft skills. That's about leadership, that's communication, that's collaboration, emotional intelligence. They say young professionals like yourself aren't prepared with creative thinking. And they say young professionals like yourself aren't ready with good problem-solving skills. Now, on the flip side, Deloitte did a study, and that said that young professionals and college students like yourselves don't think that their skill sets, their academic education, is valued by employers. So obviously, we have a divide, and the stakes are extremely high, right? Because a corporation, when they hire you to work with you, excuse me, to work with them, they spend a lot of money 
to find you, to develop you, to groom you to succeed. And all of you who are getting your education right now, you've spent a lot of money on your education getting ready to succeed in your life. So you want to return on that investment. So what I hope to share in this book is what can bridge that divide. You know, before I go any further, I think it's really important to share a little bit more about my background so you can tell where I'm coming from, where I share this information. So if you happen to do a, a Google search on me, you'll find that I worked in the television industry in New York City for over 10 years as a reporter, as a correspondent, as a host. With NBC, I've interviewed top CEOs, executives, and entrepreneurs, the men and the women that you see on the covers of Fast Company and Inc. Magazine. With PBS and the News Hour and the Dot News, I've covered serious topics like international trade, the economy, education, the Supreme Court. Uh, with E! News Live, I've interviewed pop stars like Aaron Carter. Uh, with BET Networks, I've created documentary series. My writing can be, uh, be read in a variety of outlets like Inc. Magazine and Entrepreneur.com. Uh, I led the higher education team at international personal branding platform About.me. And a little known fact that was mentioned briefly in my introduction is that I began my career co-hosting shows on a television network called Nickelodeon. Uh, way back in 2002 to 2004, 2005, if you're confused, I'm the handsome brother in the corner with the dreadlocks. Uh, this was a long time ago when I began my career. So if you've ever asked yourself, you know, I wonder whatever happens to, to former Nickelodeon hosts. What's up? How's everybody doing today? Good to see you. Now look, I, I don't show these credentials, I don't show these networks to you and all this fun stuff to brag or to boast by no means. Because these are my credits, my Google search today. But 15 years ago, if you did that exact same search, this is what you would find. You wouldn't find anything. Maybe for many of you, this is where you are right now as you are beginning your career. It's blank slate, this blank canvas. You see, I'm from a small town in Michigan. I'm from one of those small towns where people do not leave. I am from a family that experienced a lot of instability. Before I graduated from high school, I moved over 15 times, over 15 times in my small hometown. But between my mother and father are a total of like six divorces. I also know it's like firsthand to live in a shelter for battered and abused women and children. I'm a first generation college student, the first person in my family to go to college and be able to earn a degree. Now, I don't share any of this with you to elicit any sympathy by no means. Oddly enough, what I just shared with you, for many years I was ashamed of it and I was embarrassed by it. But oddly enough, I found that those things right there are many of the reasons why I'm standing here with you today. It built up a certain amount of grit that a lot of people are talking about today. There's a great book out right now called Grit by Angela Duckworth. This built up that grit, that perseverance, that resilience, that character to move forward through challenging times. Now many of you, there's something about you that's unique that someone would never find in a Google search. And I want you to know that whatever that is that people may not know right now, use that to your advantage, not your disadvantage. Own that as opposed to hide that. And you have a blank canvas right now as you begin this summer and you, as you begin your career, you have a blank canvas if you were to paint and to create and to sculpt what you most want in your life. And I believe the three things that we'll get into today that will allow you to do that are, are these three topics right here. That is being willing to turn up the volume, being willing to find the edge, and being willing to do something that seems obvious, but for some reason not a lot of people do that. That is find people who make you better. And if there's a thesis of everything that I do of my work, it's this right here. That is being willing to be the CEO of your career. I've had the opportunity over my life to interview and profile extremely talented CEOs, entrepreneurs, you name it, who have built billion dollar companies. And one thing I've noticed in these men and women is this, is that they take full accountability and responsibility for their experience. They're willing to have an agenda. They're willing to have goals. They're willing to be proactive versus reactive. A lot of employees come in and they wait for things to happen. I'm inviting all of you over this course this summer to be proactive and make things happen. Yes, Google's gonna do amazing things for you. The question begs, what can you do for yourself during this time that you are here? So let's get into this with turning up 
the volume. Many years ago, uh, I started my career, I uh, worked briefly as a local news reporter for a really small television station. And I remember walking into my news station one day and my news director happened to be sitting there and he was looking at reels that reporters had sent in from all across the country. These are men and women that wanted to work for the television station that I worked for. They wanted to replace me. So he saw me and he, he called me into the office to watch these reels with them. And after a few moments of watching some of the reels with them, I had to ask him to stop and we pushed pause. Because what I noticed as we were watching these reels was that the volume was turned down on the television. Now, as we all know, television, it's an audio, it's a visual medium. So I said, boss, how can you hire this young man or hire this young woman if you can't hear what they are saying? He looked at me, he smiled. It was as if he had been anticipating this question. And he said, Antonio, I want to see if I want to turn the volume up. I want to see if I want to turn the volume up. Think about those moments in life. You've been at home and five million different things are going on. The radio's blasting, you're on social media, you're cooking, you're doing dishes, you're having a conversation, but something happens to be happening on the television that grabs your attention. And you have to find that remote control to turn up the volume and see what's being said. Or maybe you've been at a, a party or a gathering and you're having a conversation with her right here. And she's cool, right? Right? We're having a good conversation, okay. But at some point during that party, that gathering, you notice another conversation happening over here that you want to turn the volume up on. Like, hey, I'll see you later, deuces. Well, believe it or not, every single day over the course of your life, and they say don't judge a book by its cover, but let's be real, keep it 100 as they say. People do. People are determining whether or not they want to turn the volume up on you or press mute in your career. They are doing that based on what time you show up. They are doing that based on how you present yourself. They are doing that based on your body language and energy. They are determining whether or not they want to turn the volume up on you based on what shows up with you, or with you when you come into a room. Have you ever been to a gathering or a party and the door opens and you look over and it's Tim and you're like, oh, Tim. And you know the party's about to get worse? <laughs> Do you know, you know that person that makes the party get like, oh, and there have been other times, you're at the same party, you hear the door open, you look, and it's Deborah. And you're like, oh, Deborah's here. And you know the party's about to get better. Do people want to turn the volume up on you or turn it down and press mute? You know, in this day and age, we hear a lot about personal brand and how important it is for you to develop your personal brand. Well, the best definition that I've heard that relates to personal branding is this. Your personal brand is what people say about you when you are not around. That's a simple way to put it. I don't care if it's online or in person. Your personal brand is what people say about you when you are not around. What I invite all of you to do after you leave here today is open up a Google Chrome browser and then open up a private window and then Google your name and see what those results are, because guess what? You're not around when somebody does that. You meet someone, what do you do? You Google their name. It's so funny when I do this exercise with people, they'll go to that private browser, don't go to a regular browser because you Google yourself all the time anyways, but go to the private browser, Google your name, and I see people do things like, that's not me. Other people look at that and say, that's not a flattering photo of me. Or people look at that and say, yeah, that last Instagram post isn't really what I'm all about, but it is me. Your personal brand is what people say about you and you're not around. Now, to continue on this theme of turning up the volume, um, do we have any country music fans in the room? Raise your hand. Six people. Okay, well, we'll talk about hip-hop instead. I'm a big hip-hop fan, and way back in 2001, I went to a rap concert in New York City in Irving Plaza. I went to go see one of my favorite artists at the time, this guy by the name of Talib Kweli, and he is still one of my favorite artists. I remember getting to the venue early, right when the doors opened, and as I was walking in, I heard someone say from the loudspeakers, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our opening act. You don't know who this person is, you probably haven't heard the music, but they're extremely talented. Please give your love, please give your attention, please give your energy to our opening act. 
and this opening act came out and started performing. Now I invite all of you to think about those times that you've been to a concert and the opening act comes out and you are not familiar with them and you are not familiar with their music. What do you do? Well, people I know typically they'll pull out their phone, they'll have a conversation, they'll grab some beverages, they'll do anything but pay attention to the person on stage. It's not because they're not talented, it's not because they're not gifted, it's just that they don't have any context. And look, in 2001, there was no SoundCloud. So you weren't researching this in advance. But interestingly enough, after that opening act started performing, they made me and a few others in that venue want to turn the volume up. And the reason why they made me want to turn the volume up is because even though pretty much no one, and I mean no one was paying attention to them, they still were giving absolutely everything. It was as if this opening act was performing to a sold out arena while no one was paying attention. It was as if this opening act was a multi-platinum Grammy Award winning artist. It was as if this opening act was already performing at the MTV Music Awards. While no one was paying attention, they were giving absolutely everything. The question I have for everyone in this room is what do you do when no one is paying attention? Think about those times you've been in the classroom or you've been involved in a group project and you know there's that one person because there's always that one person that will do all the work in that group. You know that person? Do you let them do all the work just because they will? Or maybe you've been really committed to getting in better shape and you meet a friend of yours a couple of times a week at 6 a.m. to go to the gym. But the night before you get a text message that says, dude, not going to be able to make it. Do you still go to the gym even though that person's not going to be there? Or maybe you've been really cognizant of focusing on your health and wellness and not eating processed foods, but it's late night, you're tired, the last thing you want to do when you get home is cook something and you happen to pass by a fast food restaurant. Do you still pull in when no one is watching? What do you do when no one pays attention? I'm a firm believer that what you do when no one is paying attention will deliver the results you do or do not want. Well, getting back to that concert way back in 2001, that person on stage really impressed me, but time came and went. But I remember in 2004, three years later, 2004, three years later, I remember hearing some buzz about some new artist on the scene. Some new album was dropped that everyone was raving about and talking about. So I keep all the ticket stubs of the concerts and the sporting events that I go to, and I went and grabbed that ticket stub, and I cross-referenced it, with that album and all those articles, and I found out that that person who was giving absolutely everything when no one was watching three years earlier was someone by the name of Kanye West. Now, it goes without saying that Kanye West believes in Kanye West. <laughs> is that fair to say? The question is, if Kanye West did not believe in Kanye West three years earlier, who would have? People give this man a lot of ridicule and a lot of flack for his, uh, his social media rants and if you want to call them diatribes and his opinions. But I don't look at this man the same way. Because for three years before anyone knew his name, he was giving absolutely everything while no one was paying attention. In many ways, I feel like he's earned it. He can say whatever he wants to say. His success didn't come three months later, six months later, one year later, two years later, two. No, three years later, the album came out. While no one's watching, he was giving absolutely everything. What do you do when no one is watching? Well, this gets across for me this whole notion of you don't climb a mountain by accident over the course of your career. You know, I talk to a lot of young professionals and I do a lot of consulting with organizations and a, and a similar refrain is that people want more responsibility. They want the bigger projects. They want the bigger titles, you name it. But you don't climb a mountain by accident. If somehow I could miraculously airlift you to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro or to the top of, let's say, Mount Everest, which is nearly 30,000 feet altitude, what would happen when you got out? You would take in this amazing view and you would probably pass out afterwards. And the reason why is because your lungs have not earned being at that altitude. You have not done the work when no one is watching. It's no wonder when we think about reality television, I enjoy the 
They're reality television competitions like anyone else, but there's no wonder that one or two years after someone wins that television competition, we no longer hear that man or woman's name. It's not because, again, they're not talented, they're not gifted. It's because they haven't done the work when no one was watching. It was handed to them prematurely. Has anyone in this room ever, uh, anyone ever driven a stick shift before? Okay, what happens if you try to start a stick shift in fifth gear? You're going to stall. Yeah, you're not going to have a lot of luck. What I see happening with people in their careers is they're trying to get to fifth gear right away. The opportunity that all of us have is to be willing to earn first gear, to earn second gear, to earn third gear, and even learn to enjoy those stalls because that right there is where the magic happens. What I want to get across to you is, is this right here, is that ideas are useless. Ideas are useless until you breathe some type of life into them. Right now, on some of your hard drives are some of the best ideas ever that you have never taken action on. Right now, somewhere, one of your notebooks that's packed away in a file cabinet, or maybe in your notebook right in front of you right now, are amazing ideas that, for some reason, you've yet to take action on. Right now, some of the best ideas are happening over brunch conversations with mimosas. But after that second mimosa, that idea goes out of the window. Ideas are useless unless you breathe life into them. When I started off in Nickelodeon, uh, I didn't start off as a television host. I actually started off working on a show as a production assistant. Now, if you know anything about working in television and working as a production assistant, you know that it is not a sexy, it is not a glamorous job. You're making coffee, you're making photocopies, you're holding cue cards, you're carrying equipment around. But one of my goals was to be a writer. So after all my responsibilities were complete, I would write. I took writing classes. I studied great writers. And slowly but surely, my writing improved. And after a while, I built up enough confidence to go to the head writer of the television show that I worked on to ask him if he'd be willing to give me feedback on my scripts. And he said, absolutely. And I learned another key lesson, that is, nine times out of ten, people are willing to help you. But it is your responsibility to ask for that help. Over the course of the summer, there are amazing people on this Google campus and throughout the organization. They are willing to help you, but again, you have to take accountability and responsibility and be willing to ask for that support, to ask for that 15 minutes, ask for that guidance. So after a while, I started giving my scripts to the head writer in the show, and slowly but surely they got a little bit better, then they got worse, then they got better. But I'll never forget one day, the head writer came up to me in my cubicle, and he said, Antonio, um, one of our writers is out sick today. Do you happen to have any scripts ready to go? I had a, <laughs> I had a lot of scripts ready to go. I handed it to him. That day, one of my scripts appeared on the television show. A few weeks later, I began regularly contributing to that television show, and I eventually became a staff writer. And I learned a great lesson. That is, all it takes is someone being out sick one day for your opportunity to present itself. The question begs, will you be ready when that opportunity comes? Because I've seen that opportunity come. Someone is out sick. Someone goes on vacation. Someone uh, leaves to go to another company and that slot opens up and people step into it. But unfortunately, because they haven't done the requisite work while no one is watching, they struggle in that situation. You know, if you're an NFL football fan, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about quarterback Tom Brady, who's won multiple Super Bowls. What a lot of people don't know is that that starting job was not Tom Brady's initially. Tom Brady was a six-round draft pick. But there's another quarterback by the name of Drew Bledsoe, who got injured in a football game. Tom Brady came in for him, and the rest is history. And the reason why he was able to excel and succeed is because he did the work when no one is watching. And what I hear a lot when people, when I talk to them about doing the work, I hear a lot of things, you know, I'm just going to wing it. I'm just going to wing it. I, I'm, I'm good on my feet. Don't wing it. I can tell you this right here is that winging it is easy when you're well prepared. It's easy to go off script when you know the script. It's easy to break the rules when you know the rules. 
It's easy to get off of an, on an exit on a highway when you know how to get back on and know eventually, eventually where you're going. Be willing to do the work when no one is watching. And after you've been willing to do that, I invite you to, to regularly find the edge over the course of your life and in your career. Do you have any former athletes in this room, current athletes, former athletes? You know that, I don't care if you did this in high school, you do this in, in rec leagues, intramural, but you know those moments before the whistle goes off or the gun goes off in that football game, that baseball game, that track race, volleyball, lacrosse, you name it. And all of a sudden you get that increased heart rate and you get those butterflies. That right there tells you that you are finding the edge. And do you have any performers in the room? Maybe you act, maybe you dance, maybe you uh, debate, maybe you give public talks like this one right here, but in some capacity you do open mic night, but you have, to get up, you have to get in front of people. And you know before they call your name, it's your cue to come on, and all of a sudden your throat gets really constricted and your hands start trembling. That right there tells you that you are finding the edge. Has anyone in this room ever had a, uh, a crush on someone before? A lot of laughter, one hand went up though. <laughs> okay, two hands, thank you, sir. I have a copy of my book for you afterwards. But you know when you've been crushing on someone all semester, and all of a sudden this person you've been crushing on all semester shows up, and she just happens to be in the third row? She has glasses on, a t-shirt, her hair is pulled back. She's starting to blush now because she realized that the, ho the guy on stage is talking about her. You're crushing on her and you got to make a decision that one day when she shows up in front of you, what are you going to do? I've been crushing on her all semester. You check your breath. You say, what's up, girl? <laughs> Forgive me. Thank you for playing along. But that feeling right there is finding the edge. I invite all of you to think about the last week of your life. Think about yesterday. And I'm a firm believer, if you have not felt that, you are not growing and you are not moving forward in your life. As someone told me a long time ago, if you are not close enough to the edge, then you are taking up too much space. I believe that with my everything. If you are not close enough to the edge, then you are taking up too much space. What we're really talking about is this unique combination of fear and excitement. Many psychologists will tell you that fear and excitement pretty much are the exact same emotion. Fritz Perls, uh, the father of Gestalt therapy, once said that fear is excitement without the breath. Fear is excitement without the breath. Think about professional sports. If they say someone chokes, right? And it's the end of the game and they miss that easy layup or they double fault in that tennis match. Typically they say that person was, was tight, they choked. If you're tight and you're choking, that means you're not breathing. You're operating from a place of fear. But when you think about when things are going great in someone's life, specifically athletes or that talk just goes extremely well, they say you are in the zone or you are in flow. You are breathing. The beautiful thing is that we all have that opportunity to choose between fear and excitement. I can think back to a time in my life when I had to do exactly that. This is like way back in 2002 or 2003. Um, this is in Times Square, 1515 Broadway. This is the building where people, thousands of people came from all across the country, all across the world to look up into these glass walls into a studio to watch tapings of MTV's Total Request Live. Well, just a few floors up is where we recorded Nickelodeon's You Pick Live. I remember one day that the main hosts were out, so me and someone else were given the, the main hosting duties. And I'm in the studio, and there's an X on the floor where I stand, and in front of me are these three cameras. There are these big, bright lights on me like this. Behind the cameras are uh, people walking, getting ready for the show. There are kids and their parents who had traveled from all across the country to join us for this taping. And I hear the director say from the control room on a loudspeaker, we're going live in 30 seconds. In 30 seconds, we're going live. I remember sitting there saying, wow. In 30 seconds, we're going to be broadcasting live to millions of people all across the country. And as a bonus, Canada. <laughs> Canada really tripped me out because I was like, what happens in Canada? I had no idea. So I'm sitting like, wow, millions of people, my family, my friends are watching, millions of people all across the country, Canada, the kid has come so far, wow, Canada. <laughs> and then slowly but surely, I was like, wow, millions of people, that, that's a lot of people. I was like, one, two, I realized I wouldn't be able to count a million in time. I was like, Canada, that's this unknown factor. 
And all of a sudden, I shifted from being really excited, like, yo, millions of people, to millions of people. That's a lot of people. My mama's watching. My grandma's watching. And as I shifted, all of a sudden, the stage manager said, Antonio, we're going live in five, four, three, two. And he points at me. And the red light comes on the camera. The red light means we are now broadcasting live to millions of people all across the country. And as a bonus, right. That right there is my moment to welcome people to today's show in the camera. But instead of doing that, I did this. I, uh, I froze. I was a deer in headlights. Some people would say I choked. This was my moment. My moment that I had dreamed of. I'm on live TV and I froze. And what's wild about this moment was all I could think about, all I could think about was cheese. <laughs> all I could think about was cheese. Don't judge me. And the reason why all I could think about was cheese was about three years earlier when I graduated from Western Michigan University, even though I had aspirations of working in the entertainment industry, I didn't do that. I got afraid and I took a safe job as a sales representative selling cheese. Now look, you heard about my background. I didn't have the highest aspirations for myself growing up, but I can guarantee you when someone came up to me when I was a kid and they said, Antonio, what do you want to be when you grow up? I never said I wanted to sell cheese. I remember going home for the holidays when I had this job selling cheese and, and I would see friends at the mall who chose not to go to college and some are unemployed, not doing so great. And they're like, oh, Antonio Neves, college graduate. How are you? What are you up to these days? And I would say, I'm selling cheese. And they would say, I'm sorry, is everything okay? Do you need some money? I'm like, I have a job, company car, benefits, 401k. I was selling cheese. And I really despised this job. And the wild thing about selling cheese was this. I was a beast at selling cheese. <laughs> My cheese game was so ridiculous. Seriously, you have no idea. Gruyere, cheddar, jack, manchango, mozzarella, brie. Somebody give me one. Gouda, somebody got fancy in the back. My cheese game was ridiculous. I was exceptional at this, which really confused me because I didn't like my job, but I was good at it. Another one of those ding, ding, ding moments came up in my life, and that was this. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean that you're supposed to be doing it. I hope that many of you never encounter this in your life, but odds are you maybe will. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean you're supposed to be doing it. I speak to a lot of university students, and I'll ask questions like, so what are you majoring in? And I'll get an answer like, oh, integrated supply management. I'm like, cool, great. How long have you been into that subject? They're like, I'm not really into it. So why are you majoring in this? Uh, some magazines said the year that I graduate, there will be jobs available. It's no wonder, when you look at the studies, they say that workplace engagement, people who are actively engaged in their jobs in the United States, is less than one-third of the working population. It's no wonder that people leave jobs on average at, in less than 24 months because we're choosing things that we don't want to do. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean you're supposed to be doing it. And I hung in there. I sold cheese for almost a year, but I felt this metaphorical tap on my shoulder that whole year saying, this is a good job, but it's not your job. I felt guilty. On Sunday nights, I would get sick to my stomach knowing I had to go to work the next day. So I decided to make a decision to lean into a little bit of fear and excitement. And I did the scariest thing I ever did in my life. And I moved to New York City with like $700 in my bank account. $700. I knew just one person. This is pre-Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Yik Yak, you name it. That one person that I knew was kind enough to give me a floor to sleep on on three couch cushions for a few months. I slept on three couch cushions on a floor. Not a couch, three couch cushions. It's a big difference when it comes to neck pain. And when you have $700 in New York City, that doesn't go really far. I have friends today that pay $700 a month just to park their car. So I had to get to work. And I remember working uh, temp jobs from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. And then I would work a retail job at a store called H&M from 6 p.m. until 10 p.m. 
And then when I was lucky, I'd be able to get a catering, a late night catering job, serving food or serving drinks from like 11 p.m. to 2 or 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. Rinse, wash, repeat, do the same thing the next day. I was there with meaning, with purpose. I was there for a reason. I was happy actually doing this because I knew I was in the right place to pursue my endeavors to work as a storyteller in the entertainment industry. The crazy thing about this is how many people in my circle and in my life told me how stupid I was for doing this. Like, what are you doing? Why would you give up a good job with benefits, a 401k plan, all these different things to do this, to go into this uncertainty? Maybe you're going to hear that when you make some different and difficult decisions over the course of your life. And you learn that lesson that what makes you happy, it may make others uncomfortable. What makes you happy may make others uncomfortable, and that's okay. Just because you're going one way doesn't mean it's the wrong way. People, specifically our family, have vested interest in us being well taken care of and protected. They love you. So just know if you make a decision that goes counter to what they expect, they may not be happy. But you got to focus on you and what's most important. So back in that studio with that red light, that camera on me, what seemed like a matter of minutes was actually just a few seconds, like a couple of seconds. But I was able to go through my mind that whole story of selling cheese, of moving to New York City with $700 in my bank account, working all those jobs, all those things from my background that got me to that moment, being on the X in that studio with those three cameras in front of me. And I knew right then and there that I had to make a decision. And that decision was to lean into the fear or lean into the excitement. I couldn't articulate it like that back then, but it was, I knew I had a decision to make. Is a willingness to, to bet on me, actually double down on me or not. And I remember taking a breath, looking in the camera, and I smiled and I made a decision. This is it. And I said, what's up, everybody? It's a brand new episode of You Pick Live. Coming up today, we have whoever happened to be on the show that day. I really believe that that moment right there, being willing to choose me in the face of uncertainty, led to my being able to work in the television industry for over 10 years with a lot of top networks. Over the course of your career, over the course of your life, you are going to have a lot of red light moments. And I hope all of you are willing to lean into the excitement as opposed to the fear. Now, after you've been willing to turn up the volume and do the work when no one is watching and find the edge and lean into the excitement as opposed to the fear, the, the last thing I really want you to do is be willing to find people who make you better. This seems obvious, but it doesn't happen as, as much as I would like to think. When I was an undergraduate at Western Michigan University, I walked on the track and field team. If you know anything about being a walk-on and, and track and field, that means you try out for the team. And if you're fortunate enough, you made the team. And I made the team as a, as a long jumper and triple jumper. But after two years of being on the team, I wasn't doing so hot. I wasn't doing well. I remember my head coach coming up to me one day and he said, Antonio, you're not doing so well. He said, in two years of being on this track and field team, you have not placed in one major competition. That was the agreement, the bargain that we made is that you would help us win track competitions. But in two years of being on this team, you have not placed in a major competition. And he was right. I think the only thing that I placed first in those first two years was in line at McDonald's after our track and field meets. And I thought at that moment, Coach Shaw was going to cut me from the team and I would lose my opportunity to potentially earn a scholarship, which would have been really helpful because my mother at that time was paying for my tuition on her credit card. But Coach Shaw didn't cut me. Instead, he did something else really powerful. He said, Antonio, I don't know if you know this, but we have two All-Americans on our track and field team. And he pointed to them on the track. We have two All-Americans on our track and field team, yet in the two years that you've been on the roster, not once have I seen you spend any time with them. He was right. One gentleman would go on to compete in the Olympics. Another one would go on to compete in the World Championships. He said, instead, Antonio, you're hanging out with those guys. And he pointed over to the high jump mat. Now, if you know anything about the high jump mat in middle school or high school or collegiate track and field, the high jump mat is essentially the club. That's where people, your teammates go, hang out, laugh, lay back, and relax. And that's where I spent the majority of my time. It's not that my teammates on that high jump mat were bad people and doing bad things, but they weren't all Americans. And it's true, I didn't spend time with those All-Americans because they got up earlier than I did. They ate better than I did. They passed on the parties that I went to. I mean, why would I do that, even though my mother was paying for my tuition on her credit card? Coach Shaw walked away. He didn't cut me. 
But what Coach Shaw did for me in that moment was introduce me to this concept of thieves and allies. You know, thieves are those people that don't encourage you, that don't inspire you, that don't challenge you, that don't push you, that don't hold you accountable to be the absolute best version of yourself. These are those people you spend a lot of time having brunch with, talking about all the things that you're going to do, knowing that you are never going to do them. These are those people that my, my friend, the author John Gordon, calls energy vampires. You know those people you spend time with them and after they leave, you have less energy than when they arrived? These are those people that somehow always have drama going on in their lives. Do you know anyone who has drama always going on in your life? You call them, what's up, how are you? And they say, you're not gonna believe what just happened to me. Like, why are things always happening to you and no one else? You know those people? Now on the flip side, the opportunity that we have is to spend time with allies. Allies are those people that do encourage you, that do inspire you, that do challenge you, that do push you, that do hold you accountable, that test you to be the absolute best version of yourself. Allies are those people that you do spend time with at lunch talking about all the things you're going to do, then you leave lunch or brunch and begin working on them. Allies are those people that don't take energy away from you, they give you energy. Allies aren't those people that have drama going on in their lives. They actually have great things going on in their lives. The beautiful thing is that not only can you surround yourself with allies, but you can also be an ally to others. What I'd like you to do right now is just take a second and visualize the five people, the five people that you spend the most time with. And ask yourself a really simple yet challenging question. And that is, do they make you better? Do the five people you spend the most time with, do they make you better? I ask this question across the country all the time, and I see some people just shake their head like, no. You see, the thing about allies is they provide something that I like to call, they provide good friction. And I invite all of you to find good friction in your life. I'm from up north in Michigan, and we get a lot of snow up there. And every now and then a, a car can get stuck in the snow, and that, that tire will just be spinning in the snow. But for us to get that tire moving and get out of that snow, what we do is try to create friction. So we'll put kitty litter under that tire and it will propel us forward. Or we'll put sand under that tire and it will propel us forward or salt, you name it. You know, in dire circumstances in the woods, you can start a fire with two sticks and some kindling. I like to think about diamonds. How are diamonds formed? Under millions and millions of years of pressure, the soil wasn't massaging the shoulders of diamonds. I invite all of you to be willing to find good friction in your life. Those allies are going to hold you accountable, but they will take you further in your life as well. What I find when I go to corporations and I go to universities, we're in an interesting place right now that's really scary for me because I find that if someone receives the slightest bit of feedback that they disagree with, the first response is that person's an idiot. My manager doesn't know what he or she is talking about. Or if someone doesn't agree with the thought that you have, on many college campuses, people are like, we should get him fired. I invite you to find good friction. Things can come from that, especially when it's constructive feedback in our lives. Think about all those times someone has disagreed with you. Have you been willing to find that good friction in your life? When I was in grad school at Columbia University, I remember turning in my, my master's thesis, and I'd be so afraid because I knew my master's advisor, when he finished with it, it'd be covered in red ink, and I'd have so much more work to do. And he saw my trepidation of submitting my thesis to get reviewed, and one day he looked at me and said, point blank, Antonio, don't you know you pay for the red ink? You pay for the red ink. Find the value in that. Not what's wrong with it. Find the value in that. I think the challenging times we're in right now also involve this right here. Like many ways, we're, we're doing things, I think, for a lot of the wrong reasons. We're doing things for likes, for retweets, for double taps, for views, shares, you name it. I have a decent social media following, but I can tell you right now, if I really need support and I really need guidance, I can count on these two hands who really is going to be there for me in this life. Those are those allies. I invite you to know that supporters are greater than followers. Over the course of your career, supporters are going to be greater than followers. And know that we is greater than me. 
I invite you over the next few days to pay attention to the language that you use as you communicate with colleagues and your team and see if you say I and me more than you say we and us. I and me, when it comes to communication, creates distance. We and us, it brings us closer. It brings us together as a team and allows us to collaborate that much more easily. Now look, I really believe that if you regularly turn up the volume and do the work when no one is watching, great things can happen in your career. I believe that if you're willing to find the edge and lean into the excitement as opposed to the fear, amazing things will happen in your career. If you find people who make you better and spend time with allies as opposed to thieves, you will get exceptional results. The beautiful thing is this, is this what you have right now in your life with this internship in your life? You have a blank canvas, the one that we showed you earlier. It's your opportunity to paint, to sculpt, to create what you most want to create. But it's gonna require you to have that CEO mentality, being willing to be proactive versus reactive, having an agenda, identifying what's most important. And I cannot promise you that everything is gonna go fantastic over the course of your career. It will not, there'll be bad days, bad weeks, bad months. But I think about a time I was reporting a story in Juneau, Alaska. If you know anything about the, the weather in Juneau, Alaska, it rains a lot. I remember walking around downtown Juneau, Alaska with a big umbrella, and I noticed that none of the locals were using umbrellas. I got confused. I went up to a local and I said, excuse me, sir, I'm not from here, but I noticed no one here uses umbrellas. Why is that? He looked at me, had glasses on, they beat it up with water, and he said, you know, man, it's just water. It's just water. When you're having that bad day, that project wasn't received the way you thought it would. Know that it's just water, and sometimes we have to let ourselves get wet. We have to get drenched and learn from that. That builds up grit, that builds up resilience, that builds up perseverance, that builds up character, those things that will allow us to plow ahead forward in the future. The truth is, is this, that no one cares, and I hate to say this, but no one cares more about you and your career than you do. Yes, your advisor at college does, but they can't care more than you. Yes, your manager cares, but they can't care more than you. Yes, your parents care, but they can't care more than you. Your significant other cares, but they cannot care more than you. At the end of the day, the results you do or do not get in your career are up to you. Effort is between you and you. You know what you're willing to give and what you are not giving. People always give you this notion that uh, college, the best years of your life, I think that's rubbish. There's some amazing years, but I'm a firm believer that the best thing that has ever happened to any of you has not happened yet. And that's how I invite you to wake up every single day when you have this blank canvas. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Definitely feel free to come say hello online. The question was, uh, what has been the biggest challenge in your career? Um, I think a couple of things pop in my mind. One of the biggest challenges was learning how to break the cycle. Uh, I come from a family that didn't go to college, that, that hasn't necessarily been professionals in their life. So before me, there was no track record. There was no blueprint. So in many ways, I had to figure this out on my own, but I quickly realized I can't do this by myself. So I've been able in my course of my career to surround myself with um, a lot of great mentors and people who, who have been there, who have done that to get through those challenging times. Because again, I, I had no blueprint. There was no one in my family that I could go to and say, hey, I'm experiencing X, Y, and Z because they hadn't experienced that. So, you know, as they say, it takes a, a village, right? And uh, sometimes we have to create our own village and identify those people. And again, people are willing to support you, but it's that willingness to be humble and ask for that help. Uh, also, you know, I show you all these networks and those, those cool things that have happened in my career, uh, but I've been fired from jobs as well. Contracts haven't been renewed. And that willingness, that knowing this, again, the whole, the best thing that has, that has ever happened to you hasn't happened yet. I've had to remind myself of that during challenging times. You know, the television industry is extremely volatile. One day you're hot, the next you're not. And so I had to know that my validation in this life can't come from exterior motives. You know, on Facebook, I have one of those, uh, those blue verification badges, like you're verified. And one day a student asked me earnestly, he's like, Antonio, how can I get verified? on Facebook or, or Twitter or, or Google Plus, you name it. And um, I looked 
And then when I started giving the answer, well, look, I work in television, I'm a journalist, and, no, and I stopped. And I said, don't you know that you were verified the day that you were born? That can't no blue badge verify you? No blue badge can verify you. Really? Oh, now I'm verified because this organization says I'm something? No. And for a long time in television, I sought out external rewards and acknowledgement and had to realize it started here inside. So I hope that answered your question. Uh, but that's uh, the short answer, but I'd be willing to talk more about that afterwards. We have a question over here. Just stand up. You can just project your voice. Absolutely. The question is, Antonio, when, you know, over the course of your lives, people are going to say, hey, what's your story? Or tell me about yourself. And that's a big opportunity for you. Unfortunately, when I see people early on in their career, they tend to give the, the resume answer. Uh, I'm a junior at a Western Michigan University. I'm studying in marketing. Uh, I'm originally from Jackson. And this this long, boring, chronological story that makes me want to fall asleep. And it's not because they're bad people. It's just that no one has told them anything otherwise. Now, your goal, when someone says, what's your story, tell me about yourself, whether it's on a plane, in line at Starbucks, or in a job interview, is hopefully to get this response from that person after you answer. And that is this. Tell me more about that. Your goal is to get someone to say, tell me more about that, to draw them in. So what I invite all of you to do is, is take some time and identify three things in your life that really make you unique, that not many people know about you. Those things that would never show up on a resume. Many times those things that would never show up in a Google search. I mean, there are many students that work full time while going to school full time. They don't think it's no big deal. They're just doing what they've got to do to pay for their education. But I can tell you right now, if you were in a job interview and someone says, tell me about yourself, and you start off with, well, I'm a student at Kennesaw State University and I, I work full time to pay for my education, right then and there, that person who is interviewing you is going to know something special about you. This person is really willing to put in the work and the effort. Or if you happen to be an international student, and you mentioned I'm an international student. I'm originally from XYZ country, which is not a country, by the way. I'm just saying XYZ just for an example. Um, from XYZ country, I, I came here to pursue my education. And you tell a little bit of that story, that arc of how you got here. That's a lot. It's, uh, people take it for, you know how hard it is to uproot yourself from another country and then move to another country and then maybe learn something and, and study something that's not your first language? That draws people in. That means you're willing to find the edge and get uncomfortable. Some people with uh, different organizations do mission trips, and they, they go and they volunteer their time, and they teach English, or they do other things. Find those things that would never show up on a resume, right? I tell people I used to sell cheese. Tell me more about that, Antonio. But those things, again, that would never show up, that would draw them in. And what that does is it creates a human connection not a business transaction. Your goal is to create a hu human connection. The best job interviews are the ones when you rarely talk about the resume. You know you've got somebody during a job interview when they're like this in the beginning, and then they just put it down. You start having a human conversation. So those things that people would never find on your resume. And sometimes it's really hard to identify those things on your own. So have a conversation with a friend to just to interview you like a journalist to get some of those to come out. I hope that was, was helpful. Right, so the question is, if you're not a person who energizes others, what can you do to help that person to become that? So, so listen, I want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Are we talking about being an, a negative energy vampire, or you're just more, let's say, introverted and communicating with others in certain capacities isn't natural for you? Okay, look, if I, if I have to, if you're... Those energy vampires, that's a whole other conversation that I really can't answer on this, on this stage. Uh, the biggest thing is awareness. Sometimes when you make people aware that they can be a, a negative influence on a room or gathering, they, they may get a little bit defensive. So you'd have to hope that they are open to actually hearing that feedback. You know, if it's unsolicited, just know they may not receive it well. Uh, if you're not naturally, let's say, uh, an extrover extroverted person, you can be a little bit quiet, you're a little bit reserved. I'll just give you an example. When you go to a networking event, just don't make it a numbers game. Some people go to networking events or meetings or gatherings or company gatherings, and they try to meet everyone. And that's absolutely exa exhausting. What I'd say is it's okay to be who you are. Don't shy away from that and all of a sudden present yourself as someone you're not some big personality. But in that 
event you attend, find one or two people to connect with and choose quality over quantity where you actually can be yourself. Nothing is more exhausting than, uh, than being, not being you and not being yourself. Don't get me wrong, you're going to find situations in job interviews where you do need to have that good posture, that forward energy. You're going to have to project your voice. If you give a talk on stage, you may have to, you know, there are things you can do with that. But I'm thinking in human interactions, just be yourself, but don't try to connect with everybody. Instead of trying to talk to five people at once and be that big storyteller, if that's not you, connect one-on-one. -on -one. Know where you shine and know where you don't shine. Right. Yeah. The question is, how do you figure out where you want to go eventually if you don't know where you want to go? Right? It's a good question. It's a conundrum, one that I've experienced before. My answer to that is just your willingness to be curious and not put pressure on yourself to actually know. You may have an overarching interest, say it's in technology, right? So it may not make a lot of sense for you to pursue working in, in the hotel industry, right? Oh, well, actually you could, I guess, technology as well. But my, I have a chapter in my book and it's titled, Your First Job Won't Be Your Last Job. So I invite you not to put a lot of pressure on yourself to get that first job right. Because knowing that in a couple of years, you're going to go somewhere else. But your willingness to get curious and try new things out. Again, knowing that this is not going to be my final position or my final decision ever. But what can I learn from this situation? So a lot of times it's trial and error. But don't put, just get curious, but don't put pressure on yourself to make the right decision. And I think in due time, as you accumulate data, like life data, you can learn what you like and what you don't like. Don't forget that it's just as valuable to know what you don't want to do as it is to know what you do want to do. So for me, when I'm, I spent a year doing something, I don't want to do that, selling cheese, that was like, yes, I know I don't want to sell cheese. That's a victory. Now, some people may frame it another way. I wasted a year. I didn't waste a year. I learned something I did not want to do. So be willing to experiment with things that you find out you don't like. And that's okay. It's a journey. It's a big canvas. So there may be a small corner of cheese in your life, and, but, you know, there's more room to paint. Does that make sense? Well, hey, thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate you. Thanks for coming.